it'll be first and 25. This is First and 25, the Football Zebras podcast. It's our 25-minute roundtable discussion on officiating. I'm Ben Ostro, and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Football Zebras. And our cast of characters tonight, senior writer Mark Schultz and writer Pat Weber. So let's take a, a look at uh, college football first. Uh, this week we had the... Uh, Number five, Georgia, going up against number one, Texas. And late in the game, we had a situation where there was a defensive pass interference called on an interception. And from that, there was, uh, let's just say, a a mighty protest from the crowd. Uh, Bottles, cans, any kind of litter made its way onto the field from, uh, as the broadcast was saying, from the student section. The thing that was of concern was, well, first we're looking at the video and we're saying, well, that's not what we would expect to see for defensive pass interference. And then they picked up the flag. And so now it's not so much that they picked up the flag, it's the optics. We have a, a flag pickup after a massive fan protest. So try and put us in the shoes of the officiating crew that, that's on the field. Well, for me, the thing that worked against the officials the most was the delay created by the fans throwing objects onto the field. There was no interceding play between the controversial penalty and the next snap. They had to call time to get things cleaned up. And that allowed the official, the calling official especially, to think. And the more he thought about it, the more he said, you know what, I really think I kicked that call. And we need to make it right. At least, Pat, that's what it seemed like to me. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with that. I think at the end of the day, they arrived at the right call. But I think that calls into question kind of the optics surrounding everything there was a long delay and you know who knows what the discussion was during that delay i mean you hope that no one was looking up the video board or that there wasn't someone calling something in that they shouldn't have but when there is that long delay and they had basically walked off the penalty beforehand you kind of wonder where it comes from it also kind of gives the impression that maybe i mean i i 100 believe that the fans or anything to not play a part into it but there is definitely going to be the impression, right or wrong, that unruly fan behavior played a part in changing a call on the field. I don't think the officials were intimidated by fans throwing things onto the field and said, oh my goodness, we're going to get hurt. We better change the call to make Texas happy. It was the delay of cleaning up the fans' mess they made that allowed the officials to really hash through that play. And since no other snap had happened, they were able to say, you know what, I think we better pick that flag up. The field judge who threw it said, you know what, the more I think about that call, the more I hate it, and I'm replaying it through my mind, and we just have to pick that up. And yes, it looked like terrible optics. And it looked like the fans intimidated the officials into picking the the flag up, but that I really don't think that's the situation. And yes, the optics were bad, but former Big Ten referee Steve Newman said in language a little more uh, colorful than this, sometimes it's better to look terrible and get the call right than be terrible. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, at the end of the day, you come out with the right call, you can hang your hat on being right. And especially, you know, for D1, those those big games, those officials, when the game is over, they're out of the stadium so fast and out of their, you, they, you, they will not be recognized. So, I, I yeah, they, I, don't, I don't at all believe they were intimidated. 
in any way. It just it just gives that to the outsider looking in. It gives off that that optics that we don't want. But at the end of the day, if you have the right call, you can you can you can live with that. Yeah, and and the Georgia coach Kirby Smart called that out after the game, and you know from his perspective, he's calling it. Here's A, B, and C, and and lining all these points out, and not implying, and actually very carefully saying, I'm not implying that there is something going on untowardly by the officiating crew, but he says the message was sent protest that call and you will get the overturn and you you cannot dispute the the timeline you know when you kind of add the coach's comments into the mix it kind of gives a little bit of fuel to that but and, and i really don't know how you you can reverse it like you said in the end they did reach the what appears to be the right decision because in the alternative where they make a uh, a change but it winds up being a little you know this this just dissatisfaction with the with the altered call then that you're in a in a worse situation so i mean at least it has tamped itself down and i'm going to try and and find a quote off the top of my head mark's going to jump in and correct me on this but uh basically the quote that i remember is don't tell me in the locker room what the call was. And uh, you have to save us on the field. Save the crew on the field. Save the crew. That's what uh, Bob McElwee said in the book, The Third Team. He said, don't you ever come to me in the locker room at halftime or after the game and say, you know what? I think we kicked that. I had a view and I think the call should have gone the other way. McElwee said, you come now. He said, if it takes a little guts, you come to me and, you, and it, you're wrong, I can live with that. But what I cannot live is you being silent on the field and let the game go over the cliff because you didn't come forward. And we can kind of take a look at, at um, what, the, what was actually called. And um, no matter when you're listening to this, uh, on the episode page for this podcast, uh, we have the video there. And... We're looking at a defensive pass interference called, and then there was an interception, so that nullified the interception on the original call on the field. But basically, you had a um, a receiver running a route. And in this particular case, I mean, the way I look at it, the, the receiver's entitled to his route. The defender is also entitled to the position on the field. Yeah, once you know, once the ball is in the air, both both players have the right to make a play on that ball. I mean, obviously, you can't go through somebody to make that play, but the defense has every right to go and get it that the offense does. If there was any flag to be thrown, you could have called offensive pass interference because it looked like the receiver may have tried a little bit of separation, but that's a stretch. That would be a very ticky-tack offensive pass interference call, in my opinion. And in my opinion, the best call would have been a no call, which said, let the interception stand. Yeah, and, and basically for offensive pass interference, you're, you're looking at, and like you said, separation or push-off in that case. And yeah, there was some there was some hands there. But again, it, it like what it seemed to be is the receiver is trying to push through because they have a route to run and a defender has established a position on the field well you have to work around it now that defender then can't just blindly cut you off either you are entitled to your route as well so that that's on the uh, on the defensive pass interference side of the ledger yeah not and not to get too far into the weeds i think that i think the route cutoff is what raise the field judge's antenna to throw the flag but uh it it looked suspicious but again no call's the best call well we see all these moving parts on on a pass and like the first thing when when we see any level of contact or or for that matter any kind of uh play that uh is a is a pivotal play in the game 
the first thing out of the announcer's mouth is there's no flags, as if there's some indication that that would uh, be uh, coming up. And instead of offering, well, you know, we do see contact there, but there's nothing. But it starts off with the implication of no flags, and then then the analysis starts in, in the video replay. Or flag does come out as the official deliberates over what, uh, what action has occurred. One, two, three. Okay, that is a foul. And then the announcer then jumps in. Well, that's, that's a late flag. And I know that at, at, at least uh, one of the networks, they're trying to coach the, uh, the announcers to stop using the term late flag but it still bleeds through on that network and on others. And it, it kind of falls into the same bucket that we're dealing with is optics, is it? When that flag comes out. But, you know, I, I kind of think that as a fan, you want that official to be absolutely sure. So if it takes an extra beat to get that flag and to throw it, the flight of the flag, that's adding uh, a second or two to everything. And Pat, you know too that uh, sometimes a late flag is the official trying to grasp the flag and he can't get a good grip on it. It takes two or three draws and then finally he gets the flag out and can toss it. Oh yeah, especially if you're uh, in a snow game or something with all the cold gear on and the flag gets who knows where and you're trying to find it. Um, sometimes it takes a second. The other thing too is, you know, I think across the board, it doesn't matter what sport you're talking about, we are wrong more when we're quick, and we are right more when we are slow and have good timing. And I think this goes back to a something I, I kind of threw out there. And again, my my perspective is is from you know from the stands and not from the field. But again, every game has a rhythm to it. So it's like whether it's substitutions, whether it's when that flag comes out at the end of the play. When you have a receiver and a uh, defender combo coming your way as a, as a deep wing, I mean, there's probably already 20 scenarios already in your head and the ball isn't even in the air. Then from there, you're, you're, you know, you're anticipating, oh, it could be this, it could be this. As, as it comes closer to completion, some of those things are, are falling away. I would say I, I do not have the deep wing perspective, but uh, you know as a short wing, you kind of play the the four, five, six main fouls that we call, just playing those in our head over and over, uh, you know, preparing for every snap, and as the play develops, like what could happen, and it definitely definitely plays into the like you said the rhythm the rhythm of of your play. Well, first of all, I wish our brains could project our thoughts and our instincts that are going when we watch the play. It would look like some space age computer program running at light speed as the they're running the route the receiver and the defender are coming into our lap we're running through all the scenarios we're judging distance we're judging hands we're judging feet we're judging the head turn to look at the ball all the while we are moving to try and get the best angle on the play and yet stay out of everybody's way and then the pass arrives you look what was that what was that make a call and or now you're now you're going to look late you have to make yes you have to process it but it has to be fast you don't want to have it be four or five seconds after the pass lands incomplete and then the flag comes in and one of the things that i did uh, hear from a former official and in the, the context that it came up it was it was a little unnerving when I heard it, which was, and it was a former NFL official, and he would say that he would throw a flag for face mask in between downs, and people are like, what, well, you got 12, 12 on, on, in the huddle or something like that? And he says, no, I have face mask on a previous play. Well, there's only one way that between downs that you're going to come up with a face mask foul and that's because you're peeking at the jumbotron. So again, yeah, that's there, but it's not there. You know, I, I hope something like that doesn't get passed on to another 
a generation of officials there. That thing, obviously, you're not dealing with this at the scholastic level, but as the schools get bigger, the screens get bigger. I hope in this particular situation it wasn't a scoreboard peak that actually turned this one around to the right call, for that matter. But the last thing I think is because they have the equipment of the microphone, and on top of that, given the gravity of this game, and this was this was something that changed who was number one in in college football. Huge implications beyond that. I mean, you you officiate a game as if it's any other game. But it does have huge implications. It's inescapable. And with the microphone there, maybe the situation is tamped down a little bit by explaining not that they picked up the flag for defense pass interference, but say we picked it up because the defender did not cut off the route of the receiver or whatever that element was. Add a little bit additional context. That's not necessary in all cases. But when you have a situation like this, you're like, okay, let me make sure everybody has this down. That kind of moves us into our second topic, which we ran into this weekend uh, in the NFL. We had a, um, and, and this, this winds up coming up in Lions games all the time. And it's something that winds up benefiting the, the opponent all the time. I don't know why there's that that luck of the universe, why that works out that way, but it, it seems to inordinately happen. And it's, it's correctly called, but Detroit doesn't want to hear that. In this case, they won the game, so it was, it was a moot point. But we had the Vikings spike the ball with about one second on the clock to kill the clock, but they weren't in formation. So originally, everybody's thinking, game is over we got to run 10 and that's the end of the game if you have an illegal formation it's not what is a snap killing foul so you have clay martin using his microphone to say this is a live ball foul there is no runoff we have another down and then we found something from 2006 where ed hockley was the referee no stranger to using the microphone to his advantage and explained the whole thing not a 10 second runoff situation how you unpack that well uh, just unpack the call and and what you think about the philosophy of a 10 second runoff not being called in that situation it was correctly called but whether or not it should be yeah i mean to the coaches they might not be happy but it's pretty simple to just this is the rule this is the what a category is the category they may not take that very well but they know for the most part especially when you get to the higher levels they know we know the rules and it might, I mean, it might not go down well, but they will, I think, accept that at a certain point, especially if you get it right and they look in the rule book after or reach out to their whoever they reach out to and say, no, this is this was handled by the rule and it was correct. I mean, 10 second runoffs, I think most casual observers, they know it's there, but it's in a complicated rule and it is what it is with when you explain complicated rules. I try to keep my high school rules straight enough and I freely admit I am not an expert on NFL rules. I thought that was a 10 second runoff, but the rules state it was not a snap killing foul, it's a foul at the snap. Now, if it was a false start, yes, that would have been a 10 second runoff, but Clay Martin and his crew properly enforced the rules. Kudos to him for getting on the mic and explaining it. And yes, uh, the coaches may not like it, but if you are a referee and you have built up enough credibility with the coaches, you will be rewarded. And I think uh, Clay Martin's ruling went a long way for him to be established credibility with the coaching staffs. When he comes over and says, Coach, this is what the rule is. You're not going to like it, but this is what it is. They're going to say, hey, Clay knows what he's talking about. We'll go with it. I don't like it, but we're going with it. And it was pretty emphatic from the the, the chatter on, on TV was, okay, this the game is over. Then we cut to a close-up of Clay Martin, who is gesturing to the sideline, one play, and we can read his lips that he's saying one play. I mean, just really kind of taking charge of that moment as, as people are starting to gravitate off the sidelines to start shaking hands and, and head out. And basically, the competition committee is looking at it. Let's not penalize for people out of a little bit off the line or on the line in a hurry up they've established themselves in a formation 
they're not running a play they're just spiking it so it's it's not like you're you're fooling anybody with that but we'll just we'll call we'll, we'll mark off the five and then that's it you do have to get set and that's where they they put in an, an extra provision that if there's an illegal shift in the other 56 minutes of the game it's a little bit different where it's okay we got motion we do do all sorts of things like that inside two minutes in a hurry up offense an illegal shift means you really haven't set you may have set for a minute but you're still you're still moving and so therefore when there is a running clock in those situations under two minutes that converts to a false start and it becomes a 10 second runoff so that's where there's the exception and so now you have people thinking well maybe the formation should piggyback on that i threw out a wild scenario there's nothing that stops a coach from saying whoever the two deep players are just set up on the ball and snap it and everybody else stay right where you are so you'll have 10 players in the backfield all part of this illegal formation so that the, the blueprint is there for for somebody to really exploit the, the rule book there and hopefully uh hopefully nothing comes about in the next few weeks again we kind of threw out a, a scenario that that maybe you just call that a palpably unfair act and just say look you weren't going to get to the line in time you got two there in time you weren't going to get 11. we're running 10 and we're going home it's not it's one of those things it's not explicitly written in there and you know well, as I say, the rule book gets thicker because coaches come up with new things. It's not because we want to write new rules. It's because somebody tried something, and then we had to write it in there. You know, I think there's there's definitely a difference between getting into a formation and having someone off the line when they are supposed to be on the line or vice versa. And kind of to your scenario, we're not even trying to be legal and we're going to exploit this. And it kind of ties into what happened with Oregon and Ohio State last week where there's a difference between running off a 12th guy who's on and there's 12 guys we're playing on purpose. And you can almost see the NFL kind of doing what the NCAA did and tying and explicitly tying it into the Palpy Unfair Act where if you're going to purposely do something, we're going to call Palpy Unfair, turn it into a run 10, and maybe that's how they plug the rule until they can actually fix it in the rule book. And the, the key element that you say is you bring up the, the intentional defense of 12 men. The, the rule interpretation was there, but the dots were not connected. So they, they issued a new interpretation that just kind of sat on top of existing interpretation. So the officiating crew on that particular day was correct to apply things in a certain manner, but uh, this might be something that is discussed in, uh, in the officiating meetings, they, they do have mid-season meetings, of course, on the training tapes, where they might just discuss that and say, hey, look, you know, if somebody pulls this wild scenario that they happen to read on football zebras because they had to throw that thing out there, maybe that's uh, something that just kind of addresses, say, hey, you know, this, this wild hypothetical, this is how we're going to handle it if some coach thinks that they're going to play around with the illegal formation rules. But it was interesting in the way that, that Steve Shaw correctly, I mean, they, they issue bulletins all season long and say, especially with college where you have so many games on so many different levels, you, you can see at just about anything. But the NFL, you've got a, a limited pool. You have 16 games at the most on a weekend so that there's less games to see anything bubble up. It was interesting to see how they handled that. So it wasn't a rule change as people think it was. It was more of a, of a new interpretation. And with that, that wraps up another episode of the First and 25 podcast. Thanks to Pat Weber and Mark Schultz. Dropping a new episode every Tuesday throughout the season. Please spread the word. And if you're listening on the Football Zebras website, you can also find this on your preferred podcasting app. And please subscribe. Please get that word out. We'd like to have as many listeners as we possibly can. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll catch you next time.